Good afternoon, everybody. Getting started here. Let me start sharing. There's my charm. Um, Chrome. Okay. So we're about to begin after exam two, the third part of our semester where we will, where we will diverge fairly significantly from what the majors are covering, which is intended. Uh, it's the way we plan what we're going to focus on for the rest of the semester, especially in the programming project is going to be stuff that that I hope will be useful to you in your academic career that is not just pure programming, but is actually programming to solve problems because that is one of the big things about Python. So going over the calendar today, uh, we're going to talk about the rest of the semester, but I'm also going to talk about exam two. Um, I'm going to give you a real quick overview on lab 11. If you had, uh, if you're in Jeff's class and had lab today, you've already seen it. If you're in Tommy's class, um, he'll cover it on Wednesday, but it's a recursion lab. It's just a little more practice with recursion because recursion is one of those topics that if you're not really familiar with it, it can take you a while to get used to. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, then I'm going to start doing an overview. We're going to work through project three gradually. You have three weeks to do it. Project three is not going to be due until the uh, nominally right now, the 4th of December, which is that Friday. Um, I might extend it to the following Monday TVD. We'll see how you're doing this. This program last semester caused a lot of problems. And the big issue is, you know, we're, we're virtual, so I can't get there to walk you through some of the things. So that's why we're going to do it differently this semester and that we're going to walk through it in phases. And I'm going to get you started today. Uh, the official handouts will go on GitHub for a few days, but we'll get started today. The bottom line of what Project 3 is, is using Jupyter Notebooks to do data analysis and report presentation. If you don't know what a Jupyter Notebook is, not a problem, you will by today. It's a really cool tool in which you can embed um, Python code and language that's called Markdown uh, format to provide a research report. It's a general thing that a lot of people use to present research results, to present reports, to present whatever, and that it, it's really nice and that it can be updated. You have living code, and it's one of the really cool applications to me of Python. That's what the project's going to be, and we're going to get you started on that in the next couple of days between today and Wednesday. Today's lecture is going to be on importing code in Python because that's an important, no pun intended, part of Project 3 and how you will use Python. Okay, so I first want to talk about exam two, and I may have to share a new window to get to this. Let me see, where did I put, where did I put, here we go. Actually, I don't have to share. This should be visible to you. This is exam two. The bottom line is uh, I was generally pleased the grades were pretty good. There's one question I need to talk about. I, I let some things slide because I guess the question wasn't clear enough. Uh, we'll walk through this. Um, let's see. So the first question was, if you have a 2D list called students in Python, how would you refer to the element in the last row of column I? In the last row of column I can be, uh, the last, remember the first index is always the row number, so you're looking for I in the first index, so it can't be B. It can be A, C, or D. Now, the last column, the last element in any list, uh, length of students is actually too many. If you remember, we start counting at zero, so the last element is always length of students minus one. If you have length of students, um, by itself, you'll have one index too far, and actually length of students is gives you the number of rows, so that's wrong for that reason. So A is wrong for a whole lot of reasons. 
one, that's the number of rows, not columns, and two, if you was the number of columns, it would be one too many. So A can't be the right answer. Um, so it's going to be D, right? The last element in any list, the last element, the last column can be minus one or length of the column minus one or whatever. So the answer to number one was D, student sub I minus one. Question two, a priming read is one way of assigning an initial value to the variable in a while statement. That is true. Okay. We talked about this before. If you're using a while loop and your while condition has some value of a variable uh, in that expression, um, you know, you're asking someone enter a, a, an item number zero to quit, right? You have while item number is not equal to zero or on the while loop. Well, you have to get an initial value in there. Unlike a for loop, a while needs an initial value. One way of getting that initial value is just assigning something that's nonsensical that won't hurt anything. The other is to do a priming read. Priming read says get a value from the user before you execute the while statement, and that gives you your initial value, and so you don't fail the beginning. So two is true. Three, which of the following is true about a dictionary? The answer is all of the above. Okay. It is unordered. There's no order. It establishes a relationship between a key and a value, and it's mutable. So all of the above are true about dictionaries. Or if you have a dictionary in Python with the following content, we have the Maryland state officers, the governor's Larry Hogan, the lieutenant governor's Boyd Rutherford, the attorney general's Brian Frosch, and the comptroller is Peter Francho. What happens when you execute the statement print State officers dot get speaker minus one. Well, remember how the get method works for dictionaries. Speaker is not a state officer in this definition. There is no key of speaker. So this would fail except the minus one tells Python what to return. If this key does not exist in the dictionary, you return minus one. So the answer to this question is that uh, it returns minus one because speaker's not a key in the dictionary. Five, immutable variable such as a list and you assign a new value to it, you change the values associated with the existing locations in memory, that's true. That's what mutable means. We'll get to immutable when we get to that short answer question later on. Six, you've got a fat, you've got a uh, rec recursive function. And the question is, what are the base cases? And the base cases are zero, one, and less than zero. These are all three base cases. So the answer is this one, any negative number, zero and one are the base cases. Seven, what's the best way to develop complex programs in Python? or in any other language, told you you were gonna have, this is a question, nobody missed it, I was glad to see. Test as you go, design the program, write a function, test the function, make sure the function works before you try, start writing other functions. All rows in a 2D list must be the same length, false. They can all be different lengths if they want to. Nine, all programs can be written recursively, can also be written iteratively. Why do we ever program recursively? The first answer, some programs are just easier to understand when thought about recursively. Uh, the rest of them, no, they're not faster, they're generally slower, because it's a cool skill for a software developer to have. Yeah, no. 10, where could a function be called in Python? The answer is anywhere other than the left-hand side of the assignment state. Anywhere else you can call a function. Uh, five errors in the program. Let's see if I can remember this off the top of my head. Um, uh, one of them that only a couple people got, which is not a big deal, it's not a problem, is that you are dealing with factorials. You never actually convert the numbers, the uh, values from strings into integers. 
Okay, you split by new line, so you have a value on a list. You have a, but you have a list of strings. So one error is that generically you never actually convert these things into numbers. So this this possible cannot possibly work because you can't compare a string to zero. So that was one error. Other than that, um, with should this line two should be with open file name as f line three this should say f dot read not file name um let's see where else are they uh, i'm off the top of my head uh read file f for number in d1 product or a number print number the print statement is incorrect. There's a comma or a plus or something missing right here in the string. And there's one other one where there's something missing, a colon or a semicolon or, oh, the colon after else. That's what it is. Thanks. Yep. There we go. All right. So most people got at least four of those. Uh, next one, suppose we have at least two lists using zip write code that creates a dictionary. This one, what I let slide is a lot of people did not include the dict or dictionary command. Uh, using the zip function is you would say new dictionary equals dict of zip of superheroes and secret IDs. Um, if you just said zip and left out the dictionary, I gave you credit for it. Uh, the question wasn't clear enough to say, if you just use zip by itself, it returns an object. It will work, but it returns an object, not a dictionary. You need this dict here in front to make it technically correct. But as I said, if you left out the dict, I let it slide. It, it wasn't worth taking off one point. The question wasn't all that clear. Um, write a function, print grades, takes one parameter, which is a list. If the list is not empty, the function removes the last value and prints it, then calls itself recursively with the new shorter list. If the list is empty, the function prints zero and returns a string. I think pretty much everybody got this. Uh, it was fairly straightforward. There were any number of ways to do it. One way you could do it was simply delete or pop the last value from the list and then call recursively with the same argument. Uh, remember arguments of the call parameters in the in the definition. You could call it actually with the same argument. If you pop the list off, that would work. Uh, or you could create a new list that had the uh, last value removed or whatever. There's any number of ways to do it. So I think most people got that when I was pleased. 14, if you try to open a file for reading and it doesn't exist, your program crashes. But if you try to open a file for writing and it doesn't exist, the program doesn't cr crash. Why is this a good way for Python to behave? What I was looking for is the following. When you open a file for writing, it erases anything that was there before, right? When you open it for W, everything before is gone. So effectively, as soon as I open a new empty file, as soon as I open a file for writing, I have a new empty file. Well, that's the same thing you get when you have to create a new empty file because no file existed. Either way, you have a new empty file ready to be written to. So that seems to be consistent behavior to just say create the darn thing. Uh, if you came up with any of those words, I gave I generally gave you credit. That was the idea. 15, insert immutable, but if A is one, we can say A plus equals one. Explain what happens in memory when A plus equals one gets executed. Most of you got this one. The, again, the magic words, what I was looking for is this gets a new location in memory. The location in memory here is not the same location in memory that we had for this statement. That's what immutable means. Immutable means this statement executes. That location in memory can never be changed. When we do this, we have to get a new location in memory. 
16, a function with no return statement, think everybody got that, it returns the value none, which is of type none type. Uh, and the program, uh, I was generally pleased. You have the data file, which contains, I gave you the first three rows of the file, assume there were 50 that has the US states and the governor of each. Uh, each row has the state name, then a comma, then the name of the governor. Again, this is an example. These are the first three lines of the file. The file has all 50. Write a Python program that reads in this file one at a time, then separate the two values on each line and add the state name to a list of states and the governor's name to a list of governors. When you finish that part, you'll have two one-dimensional lists. One has the states and the other has the governors. Now, zip the two lists together to create a dictionary. Each state name is a key, and then the last write a loop that goes through. So this I used was, it's a long program, but I used it because it tested a whole bunch of things that we covered this semester. Um, the key things I was looking for is, you read in the file a line at a time. That says either use read line in a loop or read lines. Either one of those is acceptable. If you used read, then I wanted to see that you immediately broke up that list um, before giving you credit. So what I wanted to see from that statement was you could read in the file either using read lines or read line in a loop. Either one of those was acceptable. If you did read in the whole file, then it was key that you immediately split on new lines to give me the, the um, things. So now what I have either way with a read line in a loop or a read lines is a list of strings. Each string has two values separated by a comma. So then I looked for you to um, just do a split on the uh, split on the string. So you had the state name separated from the um, governor's name, and then you had to simply append those to a list. You created an empty list of states, you created an empty list of governors, and you appended this, the state name and the governor's name to that list, okay? That got you credit for this one. And then, you know, this was to try to be clear, I wanna see two one-dimensional lists at this point. I think pretty much everybody got that. Now, zip, that's the same thing as above. That's just do use the dict of zip of these two lists. That's fine. And now all you had to do was write a loop that went through the dictionary. For loop was okay, while loop was okay. You knew it was exactly 50 entries. You could easily use a for each loop. Didn't matter, I gave you credit for that one. And print out the value. So I was looking to see that um, I was looking to see that um, you could actually successfully print out the governor names, okay? And I said print to the screen, not to a file, so you didn't have to worry about munging strings to do things with rights. Okay. Um, in terms of partial credit, I tried to be very generous with partial credit. Um, Again, looking at this, I broke this down. If you took a good shot at it, I don't think anybody really got less than about 10 if you took a good shot. If you got this one working, a good shot means you had solid code that did at least part of the problem. If you got this part working, you got 12. Okay, this works, that's 12. This part works gives you another four for 16 and the last four were for this part i did not deduct if you didn't make it functions uh, i went ahead and gave you credit if you wrote this without functions all together in one thing yeah i didn't knock off for style just looking to see that you knew how to read files you knew how to separate lists you knew how to append separate strings split strings you knew how to append values to lists you knew how to use zip to join them together and you knew how to write a loop to print them out. That was the test. Okay, and as I said, I tried to be generous with the partial credit. If you took a shot at it, I gave you a few points, um, as long as you were reasonable. Um, and like I said, I was, I was generally pleased with the results. There were about half the class 
we're, we're up there in the solid A, you know, 73, 74, 75. Uh, most of the rest were down in the B range. So that's not bad. I was, I was generally pleased. Uh, the final will be the same way. It'll be long. This is worth more points, but the final will work the same way. It'll be on Blackboard just like that. Okay. So that was the exam. Now let me get rid of this. I don't need that anymore. Let's go back to the slides for today's lecture and cover our next topic. By the way, if you think I misgraded your exam, let me know after class. Um, if I gave you extra points that you don't think you deserve, just please be quiet. Just let it go. Don't, don't talk to me. If you think I took points off that you should have gotten credit for, always ping me. Let me know. I'll, give, I'll consider regrading and see how we're going. Um, getting back to the rest of the schedule. We have seven lectures left, including tonight. The final is, I think, Monday the um, 13th of December, 14th of December is where it's set. So today's modules, today's lecture, we're going to talk about importing code modules and, and going into the project and getting you started on that. Wednesday, we're scheduled to talk about binary and hexadecimal numbers, in other words, non-base 10 numbers and how Python handles them. Uh, we will also spend some time on Wednesday talking about the project and, and some of the tools. Next week is the computer science part of the remaining lectures. Uh, Monday, we're going to talk about sorting and searching. We're going to look about different algorithms that people use to search for values in lists or to sort lists into ascending order or descending order. Doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to talk about linear and binary search. We're going to talk about quick sort, selection sort, and insertion sort. The plan is next Monday, the 23rd, we're going to talk about the algorithms. And then Wednesday, the 25th, we're going to talk about analysis of algorithms and performance. That is, how fast does each algorithm run and when would you choose which algorithm to use? Okay, so that's the computer science, -y, which is faster, when would you use what, how would you do this? That's the plan for next week. We will also, as we work through there, be talking about the programming assignment. Yes, I understand Wednesday is the day before Thanksgiving and this is a 4 to 5.30 class. But this is a virtual session and we will talk about it. So we will get together next Wednesday, the 25th. I don't get to have a big family Thanksgiving this year. I apologize if you don't either. I'm sorry, it really does bother me. I've got a father-in-law I'd like to have come, but he can't, uh, but we will have class. If you have conflicts and if you can't join, that's okay. I will record it. I will put the recording on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. You can look at it later. That's fine. But yes, we will be here. At, I will be here live next Wednesday, the 25th at 4 o'clock. Stay before Thanksgiving. I'm sorry. It's way it goes. Any rate, the last full week of class, November 30th and December 2nd, I have listed as special topics. Um, it will depend on how the project's going and what other issues people want to talk about. Um, virtual environments is a very useful topic that a lot of people want to learn about, get their programs, how you run on a virtual machine or in a container or something else. So presuming we're on pace and we can talk about that, then that'll fit into the November 30th lecture. And then the December 2nd lecture, we'll talk about tentatively, this is all set. We'll talk about some tools for software development that you might use in a professional environment like Flask or Django or something like that. Um, that's all subject to how we're doing on the project and whether we need to slow down and talk about some issues there. Uh, we do have class Monday, December 7th. That is the review for the final. So the last class is Monday, the 7th of December at 4, and that's our final review. And as I mentioned, tentatively, I don't see this changing. The final exam will be live on Blackboard on Monday, the 14th. And I forget exactly what time. I think it's 530 thereabouts. But that'll be Monday, the 14th of December will be the final. Um, my intent is to have the program three 
assigned a due back um, somewhere in this time frame, you'll be handing in program three, so it'll be graded. So as soon as we get your grade for the final, we'll know how you did for the semester. That's the plan for them. If you look at Hamilton's schedule as Google Calendar for the majors, which you can get to off of Discord if you care, he's got mostly, they're doing their exam this week, and then he's got mostly what he calls special topics uh, the rest of the semester. So we'll we'll diverge from them. They are going to mostly, I think the plan is study, you know, professional software development and how things like that work. I'm more interested in making sure you learn how to use Python in your academic and possibly professional career. So that's why our project three is so different. Okay, so we've talked about the exam. We've talked about the schedule. Now I want to talk very briefly about lab 11. You had it in Jeff's class this morning. You'll have it in Tommy's class on Wednesday is appropriate. Um, what lab 11 is looking for. Uh, wrong thing. Here we Sorry, there we go. What Lab 11 is looking for, um, if you're having a problem, uh, a couple students have had problems copying the, the file from Hamilton's um, directory for some reason. I've got a copy of it in my files. If you can't get it from Hamilton, ping me and I'll, I'll see if you could copy it from my files. The idea here is we're going to recursively go through a string and using this recursive strategy, we're going to build a list of all possible permutations. Now he calls it a scramble. This is simply just a mathematical permutation. All the way, all the ways to permute to write the letters in a or numbers in a three letter, three character long string. So we know that Given 201, if you've taken your math classes, there are three ways to write the first one, two ways to write the second, and only one to write the third. So there are six possible ways to permute 201, and they're down here. So what you're going to do is write uh, a program that will calculate the six different ways to permute 201. Now, if you had written this iter iteratively, you would be doing what's called a breadth first search. You would do the two and then the zero and then the one. And basically you would work left to right across this uh, data structure, across this tree. That's how iteration works. Iteration will let you go across the tree left to right, a, a breadth first search. With recursion, you're going to implement a depth first search. You're going to go the two, and then you're going to go the two zero, and then you're going to go the two zero one. And then you're going to pop back out and do the two one and the two zero, and then you're going to have finished that. So you're going to pop back out and go to zero, then you're going to go to zero two, zero two one, pop back up, zero one, zero one two, pop back up, come to the one and do it this way. That's the code you're going to write. You're just going to use a recursive um, function to do this. Now, think about what is the base case, okay? Well, it seems simple that a base case would be when, there's no, when you've added the last character to the string, right? When you've added the last character and it's there, 201, that would be a base case, but let's go up one level. If there's only one character left, then we can go ahead and add that and we can call that a base case. So if you want to write the base case is when you have everything on the string and the remaining length of the string has, uh, the remaining length of the string, the string is of length zero, then you're done and that's a base case and you can call recursively, okay? And that will work, okay? An alternative is to say the base case is when you're right here at 20, when your length of the remaining string is one, you can just go ahead and append that one item here because there's no more permutations, there's no more branches to the tree, and you can call this the base case and go from there. Okay, either of those will work. This is clearly a recursive case. When there is more than one character still to add, 
there is more than one character in the original string still to add. That is clearly a recursive case. So when you write that, you've got to think of your base case and a recursive case is clearly recursive. Okay. This is simple because there's only three characters and so three factorial is six. There's only six permutations. This is a little bit harder because CMSC as a string uh, is four characters. We know from math that four factorial is 24. So there are 24 permutations of the letters in CMSC. Now, we will not take into account the fact that the C is, re is um, repeated. So we will treat the two C's in CMSC as different characters for how this algorithm works. Otherwise, it gets really ugly. Okay. If we treated the two C's as the same thing, then your code gets a lot more complex. So don't worry about the fact that there's multiple instances of the same character. Four factorials is 24. If somebody types in a four-character string, there's 24 combinations. If somebody types in a five-character string, there's 120 combinations because that's five factorial. Um, let me get to the terminal. Let me make sure I'm sharing my terminal. Hold on just a second. Okay. This This is the file that you're going to be copying from Hamilton's uh, pub directory. Again, if you're having trouble, ping me, see if you can get it from my directory instead. Uh, it should be, the file will look like this. Uh, as always, you put in your name, date, section number, etc. Now, this is a recursive function that, per, that scrambles a string. Uh, current scramble is so far, and the letters left are the letters left. Uh, it prints out the scramble as it's completed, uh, completed. Here is your function. You have to address the base case first. Okay, so think about what the base case is. I gave you a couple of hints. Think about how you want to do that. Uh, if it's the base case, you're printing out. Okay. Otherwise, if it's not the base case, it's a recursive case. The recursive case is how many letters are there left for each letter. Now you have to um, uh, get the next letter. Well, what this does is it gets the next letter from the string, from what's left of the string, copy it, copy the string without the letter. This line, this comment, is why I told you about, you know, if there's a repeated letter, don't worry about it, ignore it, because this code just deals with the first one, okay? We give you part of the code for the recursive case and set it in there, and now you've got to make the recursive call. So the main thing you've got to figure out how to do in the recursive case is do the recursive call, which is fairly straightforward. And then the main program um, just asks for what's the call to the function and you're done. Okay, so this is what the file looks like, and it's fairly straightforward. It's a recursive function that implements a depth first search of a tree that contains the permutations of an input string. So, might seem a little daunting, but it's actually a fairly straightforward exercise, and it gives you practice in implementing recursion. So that is lab 11, and you have till Friday night. Now, actually, we are finally, after half an hour, getting into the first of the main topics tonight, which is importing code into Python programs. Now, we've done this a little bit, but let's talk about how it works explicitly. You can import your own code into your Python program. Okay, and we're going to show you how to do it right now. This is useful because suppose I write a function for an assignment or for a research project or for whatever else I want to do. And I want to reuse that function in a different program. I don't want to write it again. Again, we've talked about writing code multiple times before. 
the more often I write something, the more likely I am to make an error somewhere to put a bug in there that's going to cause me problems. I'm going to have to fix it. I have to diagnose it and fix it. So I want to reuse the code. Well, I can always copy and paste, right? If I write a function, the function does something cool. I need the function in the next program. Uh, I could copy and paste it in. But that's just not Pythonic. That's just not cool. I mean, think about it. You know, we've talked about how to read in a file as a, uh, a, a file as a string and turn it into a 2D table of who wins how many gold medals with strings, integers, and what have you. You may want that same read function in tons and tons of different programs because you're going to be reading in lots of files with tables. Okay. You want to use that same thing. You don't, you could copy and paste it. You don't want to. What we're going to do is show you how to import it. Now, first we're going to show you, and then we're going to come back and take the rules. I wrote a program, and I'll pay, these are not posted to GitHub yet, but I will do that. I wrote a program called dates.py. The name dates.py is important. We'll talk about why in a minute, but this program is called dates.py. Dates.py contains a function called convert date. Convert date takes one parameter called date as string. It is a string and it specifically contains a date in the form month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. The standard way of putting it, 0101-2020. 0907-1975, etc. It's a string, it's not digits, but it represents a date. Okay, so we want to convert that into what number day in the year is this uh, date. The user's going to type in a day, a date, month, day, year, and we want to know what date of the year is that date. January 1st is obviously the first day. If it's not a leap year, December 31st is the 365th day. So I've written this. This is not the most elegant code, but it works. And what I do is I say, well, the month, remember, is the first two characters in that string. I've asked the user to type it in month, month, date, date, year, 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 year. Okay. So um, the first two characters are the month, but again, they're strings. So I've got to convert them into integers. So I take the first two, zero and one, or start at zero, don't take two. And I convert that to an integer, and that tells me what month it is. The day is the integer value of the numbers in the uh, third and fourth positions or index two and index three. So I take index two and index three and convert that to an integer and that tells me what the day is. And then the last four uh, tells me what year it is. And obviously I could have left off this zero. I just left it blank, but as I was typing, I put the zero in, it doesn't make any difference. Now I have a really inelegant way of calculating what date, what number day it is, but it works as long as it's not a leap year, right? If the month is January, the day of January is just the day of the year. If the month is February, the day of the year is just the 31 days of January plus the day in February. Now ignoring leap years, if the day is if the month is March, then uh, the day is the 31 days of January, the 28 days of February, plus the day in March. And so what I've done is I've written this else, this if, else, if, else, that says, depending on what the month is, you here's how you calculate the day of the year and you return it. Now, I wrote a main program to test it. It asked the user for an input, a date in the form, month, month, date, date, year, 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 year. I call this function and I print it, okay? So I'm just going to use the run feature of Python, uh, of PyChart rather, and I'm gonna say I want to run the program dates, and I'm prompted to enter a date in the form, as we've said, two-digit month, two-digit day, two, uh, four-digit year, and so let's say 
0704-2020. July 4th is the 185th day of the year. Now, 2020 is actually a leap year, so I didn't adjust for that. But, but other than that, it works, right? So I've written this function. I've written a program. It works. Cool. Now, I have another assignment, and I want to do the same function. I have another assignment, another time where I have to do the same function where um, I'm going to convert the month, day, and year into the numeric date. I don't want to write this mixed again. And I'm not really keen on copying and pasting the code into my other program. So Python allows me to import it. So I've written another program called testing.py. Now testing.py shows you the two ways of importing this code. There are actually more, but it shows you the most common two. In this first case, I just have the keyword, the reserve word import, and now dates. Remember the program was dates.py, I don't need the .py, and we'll talk about why. This is just the program name. I'm going to import this statement says, import all the functions in the program dates.py. Okay? It so happens that there was only one, but this import statement would allow me to import all of them. Okay? Now, once I have this statement executed, import dates, it is just as if I had typed that code myself. If name equals main, print dates.convert date, dates.convert date, this says the program name dot the function name. That's what that syntax is, okay? That says to Python, from the program dates, call the function convert date with this argument, 0704-2020, okay? So I'm going to run it. Ignore the second answer for now. And this tells me I've only looked at this first value now. This tells me 185 that I called convert date from the program dates with this argument. I passed 0704-2020 to that date as string parameter. And it printed out the convert date function, returned the number 185. And it printed out 185. July 4th is the 185th day of the year, if it's not a leap year. This is one way of doing it, of importing. Now, another way of importing functions is to say, from the program, import what I want. Now, in the simplest case, I say, from dates, from the file dates, from the program dates.py, import everything, okay? This is kind of this is kind of not ideal in Python because if we're going to do this, we would probably use this syntax. We would probably just import the whole program. But it's okay, this works. Another way to do the same thing, and I'll comment this out, is I can say from dates, import, convert date. Okay, this statement is another way to do it that's a little bit better. The difference is this statement here with the star says import everything from dates. This one just says, I only want the function convert date. I don't want anything else. Now, it turns out that convert date's the only function there, so we don't import the other stuff. It's not a big deal. Okay. Um, but these are different ways to do it. Once again, 
Now we run our main program, and this time I asked to convert July 7th, 0707, 2020, and that's why this program, when I ran it, gave me 188. The 185 is July 4th from up here. The 188 is July 7th from down here. So these are examples of, I just wrote a program, I wrote a function in that program, and now I can import that function into my other programs using this import statement. Let's go back to the slides and talk about the rules for that. You can only do that in certain ways. First of all, the name of the module that you're importing must end in .py. That's why it was important that the original function was in dates.py. I had to call it something.py in order to import it. If I did not call it .py, then Python would not have found it, and I've had, I would have had some issues. I could have worked around it, but it it's, would have been extremely ugly. I needed to say .py. So Python, going back, I've got the code that we went through on this previous slide, going back through this code. Python, when you said import dates, said I will look for a file called dates.py. When you said from the file dates, Python said I will look for a file called dates.py. That's why it was important that that original code was called dates.py because this is not going to work well if you don't have it. So if you're going to write code that you're later going to import someplace else, your original file should be something.py. That's just the standard convention. Okay. And it has to be discoverable. Now, in the examples I just worked, in the examples with dates.py and testing.py that I just showed you in PyCharm, I had those two files in the same directory. So testing imported dates and dates and testing were in the same directory. <laughs> so the Python interpreter had no trouble finding dates. Okay. If it's not in the same directory, it has to be in the directory that Python always searches for programs. That's the Python path variable, and it differs by GL, and it differs for Mac, and it differs for Windows and everything else. So you have to make sure that you're in the Python path. The last option is, in the import statement, you can include the entire path to the file. But if that happens, then you're starting to write slash user, slash Alfred Arsenal, slash PyCharm products, projects, slash fall 2020, slash, okay. If you write the entire path, Python will find the file. Okay. So the rules for importing your own code are that your original module, the thing you're importing, has to end in Py, and it has to be somewhere it can be found. Now, I want to go back before I move on to generically importing code that other people wrote and talk about um, name collisions, okay? If I'm importing files from different people or even from myself from different times, how do I know the functions didn't have the same name? How do I know I imported dates? Dates had a convert date function. Maybe I imported birthday or age. Maybe I imported some program that calculated your age given your birth date and today's date. And it had a function called convert date that maybe was different than this. It just happened to have the same name. What do you do to avoid name collisions where Python can't figure out which function you mean? This is the first way to do that. If you say dates.convertDate, that will guarantee you do not have a name collision. The reason for saying the module dates.convertDate is you tell Python, go to dates.py and get convert date out of that. Now, you should not have been able to write two functions with the same name in the same Python program to start with. 
there should not be two different convert dates in dates.py. If there is, you made a big mistake and things are not going to go well in the debugging phase. But we'll get there. Okay. So this putting the module name here dot convert date has the purpose of telling Python which function you need if there is a collision, if there are multiple functions with the same name. Down here, I said convert date. I didn't tell it from dates. This will work. The part I've highlighted right now will work as long as there's not a collision, as long as there are not two functions with the same name from two different modules. If there are two functions with the same name for two different modules and you do this, you say just convert date without talking about dates, your results are going to be unpredictable. Now, that's not exactly true, unpredictable. Python interpreters have an algorithm for deciding which one they're going to use. It's just probably not the one you want. It's the standard, you know, karma being what karma is. If there are four functions with the same name, the one Python's going to pick to use is not going to be the one you want. It just it just isn't. It, you're not going to be that lucky. It's not going to pick the one you want. So if there is a collision, then you can solve that by saying module name dot function name. Okay. Now with convert date, it's extremely unlikely that you importing different modules with convert date functions. There might, but it's unlikely. But if you're importing things, various things that deal with math, you might easily import two different things that calculate square roots or two different things that calculate variances and standard deviation. So then you have to be careful when you're importing things to make sure that you're telling Python, this is the one I want to use. So you don't have to say, you know, the dates dot convert date to resolve the uh, collision if there's not a collision, but that's how you do it. And it's just easier that way. Okay. Pardon me a second. What we've talked about now is importing your own code, which is cool. And as you go further and further in your programming career and your programming experiences, what you're going to find is you will write more code and you will write useful stuff that you want to use, but you don't want to rewrite. And so you will start importing your own code. But the key to Python is it's not just you. It's not you, it's everybody, right? There is a ton of available code that exists in the wild. People wrote it, it's on the internet in various repositories that's available for your use for free, okay? There's a whole math library that we imported to use with some of our earlier programs to do statistics, right? You import math, all of these math functions that are out there. There is what's called NumPy, okay? N-U-M-P-Y pronounced NumPy. NumPy, not Numpy. If you call it Numpy, they will say you're not Pythonic and the cool kids will laugh at you, so don't do that. It's NumPy. NumPy contains a lot of code for solving linear algebra equations, for resolving things, for calculating fast Fourier transforms. If you take a physics class, you know all about Fourier transforms and analyzing radiation. Uh, it has all kinds of cool random numbers. Now, there's random numbers also in math, so you do have that. Um, but NumPy has a lot of things that you run into if you do data science. Pandas is a huge data science repository that everybody likes to use. Pandas stands for Panel Data Systems. It's a whole bunch of code that lets you do data analysis and data science. It calculates a whole lot of functions um, for you automatically. And it's a useful thing. And the nice thing is, if you want to do all the fancy data science stuff, you don't have to rewrite it. Just import pandas and call the existing function. And, and I've given you the links, the references. If you go to these links, there's a ton of documentation on what functions exist and what arguments you need. You know, these are the functions of their parameters. So you have arguments to call them and it works. Okay, pillow is a cool thing that does um, image manipulation. 
Matplotlib does a whole lot of graphics and plots uh, for data analysis. And ggplot is one I thought was cool, was even more plots. Now, last semester's project three, and I will show you, I think tonight, I think we have time tonight, what last semester's project three, some of the students did, last semester's project three was to use ggplot and pandas to do some analysis on the COVID statistics that existed in April, because that's when we were doing it. So they all went out to the Johns Hopkins uh, COVID coronavirus statistics website, downloaded some data files, analyzed them with pandas and used ggplot to draw some graphs and say, here's how various countries are doing in terms of cases, spread, deaths and the like. That was last semester's project three. You don't get all that light, but that's going to be similar to what you're doing. We'll get there. Okay. And then here's a website that has a whole boatload of others, and I'll show you more. These are libraries that exist, that are out there in Python, that are available. You simply import them into your program, just like you imported your own module, and you can use it for free and get a whole lot of work done. Okay. Again, just import it. Uh, the key, if you're importing one of these things, and we'll show you in a minute, math, numpy, pandas, is you need to make sure the package has been installed. If the package has been installed, just use the import statement. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have to load it, and we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. A standard Python distribution, when you uh, download and install Python 3.8, on your computer, you get the math library. You get a number of other libraries. Um, this was, I've also got somewhere, the, the hailstone calculation from your lab. Uh, I wrote the solution to that and um, lets you do the flight function from a main program without having to rewrite it. It's, it's fairly simple. I'll put that out there when I get a chance. Um, but it's just importing it as long as it has already been, you know, as long as you have it on your computer. If it's been installed, you just import it. And math comes standard with every Python distribution. Some of these other things I mentioned are not. Okay. Uh, we talked about this format, just import math, says give me all the functions defined in the math library and I can use them all. Um, and again, math dot sign of zero. If you just said sign, Python wouldn't know what you meant. Okay. You can rename it. Some of the names of these modules are awkward or long and people don't like them. And so a lot of people will like to rename them. I import math as M. Why? Because it saves me three keystrokes, right? Math is four keystrokes. M is one. So if I import math, and now in my program, anytime you, Python sees a variable m, it knows I mean the math module. Okay, and I can just say m dot sign of zero or whatever. Okay, I can uh, import pandas as pd. I can import scikit.learn. Scikit.learn is a uh, whole machine learning artificial intelligence library that I use way too darn often. Um, you can do that as SK or SKL or whatever. So I can rename a file when I import it. Okay. Again, I can only import the functions you need. I can say from math import star, or this is what I was showing you on PyCharm. I can say from math only import the function I need. I mean, the math library is enormous, right? It's got a whole boatload of functions. If I'm only going to calculate the sign of something, I don't care about the arc secant, um, then I can simply import the sign function. Then I don't have to refer to module. I, you know, I've got sign as long as there's sign, not sign someplace else. Um, and I don't overload my program space with all this cruft, with all these functions I'm never going to call. Uh, the star, the wildcard carrier character says import them all. Um, just make sure you don't have another function with the same name is, is the point I was talking about earlier. If you've got a function with the same name, then this notion of just using sign is no longer going to work. You've got to go back and put the module. In. Now, that's a case of um, where the thing is installed. Okay. 
I'm going to cut over to what we're going to do in project three now, because otherwise these last couple of slides won't make sense. The pandas module panel data for data analysis does not come standard with most um, Python distributions. You will not have it. You will have to install it now. There are a bunch of ways to install it. If you already know some, that's fine. We're going to use Anaconda. Okay, there's PIP, P-I-P. PIP means the package installer for Python. Okay, and some of the work we've done in the past, if you've seen things from last semester, we used to use PIP. There is Brew or Homebrew. Homebrew is an installer that works very well on Mac. It's not so good on Windows. Um, and then, as we said, there's Anaconda. So here is what you should do before Wednesday. There's no punishment if you don't, but if you want to be better equipped on Wednesday and to get started with the project, this is the first thing. So we're going to go to, well, let me get the latest Anaconda distribution. You want something called Anaconda Navigator. Get the individual edition. It's free. It's open source. There are versions for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Okay. Anaconda individual edition. And you want the Anaconda Navigator. And you want to load and install it on your computer. Okay. Anaconda is one of the things that lets you um, install all of these packages that we've talked about. Now, let me make sure I'm sharing this one. When you get the individual edition of Anaconda Navigator, again, get the individual edition, it's free. If you try to get the team edition or the enter or enterprise edition, they're going to make you pay a lot of money for a license. You don't want to go there. If you get the individual edition of Anaconda Navigator and install it on your computer, it will look something like this. Now, the Windows version, I was playing around with the Windows version earlier. It looks slightly different. It's very similar, but it looks slightly different. It has a whole set of things, tools that you can use to run in on your system. And this is how we're going to do lab three. I mean, lab, lab three, project three. So stay with me on how we do this. OK, so if you download and install Anaconda Navigator, you get it running. It'll look something like this. This is home. There's also a 15 minute video I would recommend you watch, although I'm not sure, you know, we'll cover everything by today but but we'll get to it on wednesday okay there is on the left there's home environments learning and community a lot of practice a lot of documentation a lot of blogs things like that if you click on environments here are all these modules that i just talked about okay that don't come with um uh your standard python distribution so, for example, if I want to um, install pandas so I can do some data science analysis, I simply scroll down. This is an alphabetical order. And I discover that here is pandas. And I simply tell that I want it installed. And this will automatically install it on my system with my Python interpreter. So it will now run. Um, if I wanted scikit.learn, the machine learning artificial intelligence uh, package, that is also here. As you can see, there are several thousand. I would just go to scikit.learn. So Anaconda helps me out when there's code I want that isn't available with my standard Python distribution. I can install it all here, and it's simple and easy, and it's a graphical user interface, and most people can deal with it. So don't worry about installing anything yet. Just know that you can install Anaconda Navigator, okay, on your system, and you will see that this is available. Now let's go back to home. What am I doing? I got ten minutes left. Good. 
So I've got Jupiter Lab, Jupiter Notebook. I've got a variant of Pie Charm. Um, this is a teaser. If you get this, they want you to install Pie Charm, so we're going to ignore it. Um, it's got the QT console. It's got Spider. Spider is another IDE like Pie Charm, except it really is not very good. Uh, we've got Gluviz, we've got Orange, and we've got R Studio. If you do a lot of numeric programming, if you do a lot of huge data analysis, you often program in the language called R. It's just the letter R. The original version of the language was S, and they dropped back one from S to R, and you do programming in R because it's written to be very fast, very well optimized for um, munging massive amounts of data. And, you know, I kind of like R. It's funny, I'm the kind of geek who prefers R to Python. Personally, uh, my recent master's that I got in data science, our last semester capstone project was, we were tapping into Twitter, getting what they call their, their garden hose. You can sign up to get basically a copy of every tweet that is put out by anybody in the world. You get, I think about one one millionth of them. So you're still getting a few billion tweets per day and you want to process them and look for patterns and trends, and R is great for that. All right, that's fine. The one of these that you care about that we're going to do for Project 3 is called the Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter is spelled J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. Uh, J-U stands for a language called Julia, P-Y for Python, and obviously R for R. That's what this came from. It's It's a way of writing programs that works very well with Julia, with Python, and with R. We're going to use it for Python. Okay, so Jupyter Notebooks uh, are a way of presenting results, of reporting things, of doing research that incorporate live Python code that you can execute on the fly. So let's launch the Jupyter Notebook. You will sometimes hear people call it Jupyter, but it's actually just pronounced Jupiter. So the Jupiter Notebook is launching. That's what's going on with my screen. And now what it does is it shows me these are all the Jupyter Notebooks that I already have on my system. Presuming you don't have any Jupyter Notebooks on your system, you will get this page with an empty chart here or maybe with some things that you didn't realize were Python that could be Jupyter. That's fine. Get into this more Wednesday, but if you want to see what a new um, program looks, what happens, you just click new. Uh, I want a Python 3. It will open up a web page in your default browser, whatever your default browser is, and it will look like this. Now, this is what you start with, with the new Jupyter Notebook. Don't worry, it's not going to be unfilled for long. We're going to be writing code. This is what it'll look like, and it has places where you can write and execute Python code to do interesting things. Okay, so for Wednesday, if you want to be fully up to speed on the work that's going to happen in Project 3, you should have Anaconda Individual, individual Edition installed on your laptop, and you can play around a little bit with Jupyter Notebooks and kind of get a feeling and make sure these kind of work, okay? Because one of the problems we had last semester with these Jupyter Notebooks was people didn't try the project until the last week and then they couldn't install Pandas or they couldn't get Jupyter running or they couldn't do this or they couldn't do that. And we had to try debugging from ground zero. Another note, PyCharm used to include direct support for Jupyter Notebooks we did not have to go to Anaconda. You could do Jupyter directly on PyChart. They have taken that out. Apparently, it's a money condition. They have PyCharm, JetBrains, who does PyCharm, have figured out that people will pay for Jupyter network capabilities. And so Jupyter notebooks are only in the professional edition of PyChart. They took out what they had in the free version. Bluntly, um, as near as I can tell, unless you can get a site license, the professional version of PyCharm is $20 a month for an individual student. 
please don't pay that. It's not worth it. Now, you got $20 a month or your employer has a site license or will pay the 20 bucks a month or whatever, fine. That's you. You'll, you can make it work. And if you want to do it that way, talk to me. I'd recommend staying away because it's just not worth $20 a month. There are other solutions. At any rate, this is what I want you to do to get started on project three to make sure we're all going to be there. No penalty for not having done this by Wednesday. I understand you're busy. You've got other things. But this is, um, these are all the um, Jupyter notebooks I happen to have on this Mac. This directory um, was all the students last semester, spring of 2020, and their project threes. Let's pick her. This is what you can do with a Jupyter notebook. Okay, Ellie did a great job. Okay. Uh, this is a line of Python that installs one of those modules that we talked about. It happened to install a, a module called Plot9, more plotting, more graphics. Okay, this is the line of code, and this gets executed in real time as you run the Jupyter Notebook. This is why this is useful. You prepare it, and then you have your data in your code, and you run the code on your data, and your professor or your reviewer or your audience can see what the result is. This is just Python stuff that says, hey, it worked. Okay. This is an import statement. We brought in the pandas data module as PD. Why as PD? Well, because pandas is six keystrokes and PD is two. Okay. Imported plot nine which we installed from up here. Now we had to import it. Okay. Now, data frame is a variable. This is a read. We'll talk about CSV files. I know if you're in Jeff's, uh, if you're in Jeff's discussion, he's already talked about CSVs, but we're going to talk about them later and reading them in. CSV stands for comma separated value. It's the kind of file produced by Excel or Google Sheets. Okay, so if you have a file that's produced by Google Sheets or by Excel, you can read it in this way. You can create it in Python and read it in Google Sheets it does it as well. Okay. These statements here are comments. This is what's called Markdown, in which uh, Jupyter Notebooks lets you use. You use Markdown, and you provide comments and text and descriptions of what's going on. In our particular case, we had them read in the countries and the number of COVID cases on specific dates. Remember, this was a project from the spring 2020. So we looked at the top 10 countries at that time, according to Johns Hopkins website, and it talked about how many COVID cases there were March 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and so on, all the way up through April 29th. And you can see that in the U.S. on March 1st, there were only 74 COVID cases. And by April 29th, there was already over a million, and you know how many millions it is now. Okay. But this was the kind of thing we did. Well, now it's not enough to just show to do data analytics. It's not enough to just sort on files and show tables and, and present things. You really want to interpret, right? You know, if you're doing a project, if you're doing a, or some research, if you're doing a report, you want to show some things about how these work and let somebody figure out a meaning. So let's have a bar chart. Okay. Um, Wow, here's a case of you can see how bad the U.S. looks compared to other countries in terms of COVID cases back in April, right? So you can create a bar chart, and this is automated, and that's the thing about Python. All of this is Python code that has already been written, so I can tell you to figure out how to write your own Python code that creates bar charts. Good luck with that. Um, or you can just use the code somebody else wrote and it'll do it for you. Just feed it your data and it creates this bar chart. And I said, that's not good enough. So what I wanted is um, the actual data. What was this one? I had them create, oh, I had them take this data that created the bar chart and do some munging with it, do some processing to produce a uh, another graphic I'll show you in a minute, and I wanted them to prove that it was working right. So this is just a 2D list they created. I made them print out the 2D list to show that it was uh, working correctly. Okay. And then this is a graphic which is hard to understand, but it shows 
if you were to click on it and go into it, each of these is a different country and you can see how these lines are tracking and the cases are changing over time. So that was hers. Let me see if I can find one other one I wanted to show you. I think this was hers. Yeah, this is a case of a student who got a little more creative. The bar chart was not just black and white. The bar chart was um, uh, colored and illustrated to explain what's happening in which country and what's going on. Um, and this was an interesting line chart where that other one was kind of messy because it had points everywhere. What she did here was she created a more understandable line chart. So this is an idea of what you're going to do in project three. Okay. I'm going to tell you later what the data is, but I want you to go through this in steps. I want you to get Anaconda Navigator to get started. And I want you to get Jupyter Notebook. And I want to make sure that Jupyter Notebook can run on your computer. Okay. If you're having problems with that, let me know as soon as you can that you're having problems getting Anaconda or Jupyter running. So we can deal with it so we don't have any cases where on December 2nd, you sit down to start project three and you go, I can't import pandas. I'm getting this bizarre error message. Let's please not go there. That's hard enough if I'm physically in my office and you can come in and we can sit down next to each other and talk. That's going to be really difficult based on spring experience. That's going to be really difficult to do in the, you know, virtually. We'll try. We'll do whatever we can. But let's not go there. So, I mean, you have Lab 11. It's the recursion thing that we talked about. If you're having trouble copying Hamilton's file, let me know. But you should not have any issue. I, I've put it out in my directory as well, just in case. By Wednesday, take a look at Jupyter. Take a look at Anaconda. Make sure you can get that running on your computer. Make sure it's all set. And then we will get more into what Project 3 is going to be about. This is the kind of thing you're doing. No, you're not going to use exactly the same coronavirus data. That would be too simple. We're going to work through it with other data that I've got a surprise for you on. Um, we will, while that's happening, we will cover all the computer science stuff of binary and hexadecimal digits, uh, all the sorting algorithms and the searching algorithms and how to analyze them and asymptotic performance and all that good computer science stuff. So we've covered what you're supposed to know. Uh, and then we'll spend some time with graphics. And then that last week in our special topics, it'll depend on how we're doing with the project. My current thought, as I said, is to spend some time um, with Django, Flask, and other techniques. But if necessary, we'll spend some time on project-related stuff. And that is just about it. And I apologize for keeping you three minutes too late. But um, that will do it for tonight. And I will talk to you on Wednesday. Hi, hey, Professor. Yeah, what's up? Hey, so for um, Project 2, are, were we doing the same one as the Matrix? There is no Project 2. Oh, not okay. Sorry, because, yeah, you said Project 2, and then I was looking at all the slides, and I was, uh, yeah, okay, I was getting kind of proud of when you said that, because I saw no, the No, I'm sorry. No, there is. They were talking about Project 2. No, I sent out a message, and if you didn't get it, I apologize. I've talked to Tommy and Jeff. My concern was I had a project two made up uh, that dealt with recursion, but at the uh -huh. same time we were prepping for exam two. We, I know you had homeworks four and five and you had a bunch of labs. And I looked at this and said, you know what? These folks are mostly like drowning. And the last thing I need to do is, you know, drown them even more with, with extra projects. So now the, the, mm -hmm. that, the drawback is, right, that this means program three is worth more. Yeah. But um, no, there is no program two. It's just one and three. Oh, beautiful. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah. All right. I will tell you what, that's a great question. And I will put in an announcement tonight <laughs> on Blackboard to clarify. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. No problem. All Talk right. to you later. Bye bye.